Great. Um, good afternoon and good evening or good morning uh, to all of you who join us today. Welcome to Crane Share's uh, webinar uh, that uh, I'm very pleased um, to be joined by my colleague Derek Yen. Uh, Derek is actually traveling in China at the moment. He's uh, very late now in China. He's in Shenzhen. Uh, that I hope in this webinar, during this webinar, that we could we could, we will aim. We we'll try to provide you a first-hand information. What uh, Derek is seeing, what is happening in China, uh, <clears throat> how his experience has um, has been uh, since he visited China very recently, or he's still at China right now. So this webinar, obviously, we aim or hope to bring you some uh, insights on where we see and how we see China being progressing and evolving, particularly uh, for the uh, goal, uh, the objective, the initiative the country set out for its own uh, to deliver a green economy to achieve the carbon and environmental social uh, friendly solutions. Um, we obviously uh, appreciate your time here today, uh, hopefully in the next 30 to 45 minutes between me and Derek will give you some of our insights, download some of our um, uh, latest research and thinking behind the progress made by China uh, as the largest emitter uh, for a very long period of time now become the largest reducer. How they have achieved that? Uh, what are the area presented interesting investment opportunities? And Derek obviously will give you a first hand information, but also uh, what are the sectors evolving? What are the attractive? opportunities uh, across the sectors and what can our solution offer you and access to China. Without further ado, we're going to kick off the uh, webinar today. Just a quick uh, housekeeping items. If you are dialing in or joining us from our website to listen to this webinar, you can always send your question uh, to info at craneshares.com. If you join us at Bright, uh, through Bright Talk, you can send in the question through Q&A buttons um, in the uh, app itself. Or if you join us via Zoom, you can use the button at the bottom of the app also to send in your Q&A questions. And we will address all of them um, during the uh, after the um, initial presentation between Derek and I. So um, next page, please. Uh, I believe most of you who get an invitation and join us today would have uh, some sorts of backgrounds about what we do and how we do. Just a very quick uh, reminder for those uh, new to uh, our firm, to our solution. Uh, our firm is set up about 10, uh, 11 years ago that with a singular focus is to bring the most important investment opportunity and trends happening in China and around China, centered around China, to our investors globally to make sure they have a way to bridge uh, to access uh, the opportunity. We at CreanShares, obviously, very, very privileged to be your trusted partner uh, in offering you a market insight. We have people on site to offer you uh, what we see for our eyes uh, based on the factual of development happening in the country, be that bridge to gap the language differences, the culture, the time differences, and let you understand a country, this is second largest economy in the world, what is happening onshore, what is the opportunity presented. That's our mission at Crenshaw's. Our solution is uh, spanned across two big pillars. That's on the next page. Uh, we obviously uh, have a very dedicated focus on one, provide you a China-focused solutions. Either that means you can use our solution as a beta allocation, or thematic uh, trends happening in China that you can capitalize on that trends. Uh, most important, these trends last for decades for you to trade them or use them as a core allocation in your portfolios. Um, today, we are focusing on the uh, second pillar, which is with uh, the climate change carbon uh, goal, how China is set to achieve its carbon uh, initiative. That is the green uh, solutions on the very much right hand of this page that we focus today, the solution is KGRN. All these funds are uses funds. Uh, they all are uh, registered in the major countries such as uh, UK, uh, Italy, Netherlands, uh, Germany, uh, Switzerland. Uh, we also have other countries within Europe get in touch. Uh, if you want to know more on registration, all of them are listed on LSE, uh, on both the Italiana, on Germany. Uh, Citra and uh, some are available on um, uh, Netherlands. 
uh, exchange as well. Uh, they are available in euro, dollar, and sterling currency. So today we're going to focus on the strategy called KGR and KGRIN, right at the bottom of the corner. So when we look at the next page, here is a brief uh, explanation of the investment objective or the strategy, what we're trying to aim to achieve. This strategy will work actively with MSCI to say, given all these, you know, um, 20, 30 years since China started to focus on green transitioning, uh, that the uh, companies in China has made significant progress in achieving uh, clean water process technology, uh, waste process technology, renewable energy, uh, electrical vehicles, all these fascinating sectors, fascinating industries and corporates are developing, building up, establishing, somehow also uh, leading in many of the industry area uh, in such development. Um, for instance, solar, which Derek will give you some deep dive later on the page. Today, China produced 85, probably close to 95% of the solar panel used worldwide is all produced in China. How did they achieve that? Who are the key players? How we can literally group all these fascinating evolving companies and corporates and industries in one fund and present it in front of you to allow you to access the entire progress of China uh, transitioning its economy to green economy and use that and one single vehicle to access the entire involvement um, in that sector. Uh, before we go into the featured sectors, um, com companies under each of the value chains in this fund, I want to just remind you where China started. The next page, we should put a very simple that is on this page. I know you guys heard from us all the time that saying China was the second largest economy in the world. But if you remember from 1980s is when really the country started to do or introduce this open and reform policy where they allowed the private investors to come into play, where they allowed to reform the state-owned enterprise, where they realized if they want to grow the economy, they cannot grow it by themselves or on themselves just by the state. Um, so they welcomed the introduced private player to come in, international player to come in. So they really fast forward the country from 1980s all the way to 2010, that 30 years from nobody, nowhere, uh, not a big size GDP whatsoever, $200 million, you can't call them big, all the way to a second largest economy. Uh, as fascinating to see how quickly they grown. It's also impressive to see how uh, they have prioritized the country development by establishing a very strong and solid infrastructure in the country so that the country can be ready uh, to be connected with the rest of the world so the rest of the world can also connect with China. That being said, given China has continued to develop, it's still a developing country. MSCI started to include China Asia's into their broad indices in 2018. Let's give or take about five years ago. Then China started to have a presentation or representation in the global indices, still just shy of less than 3.7%. Uh, when you compare to that um, of with number one economy in the world of the United States, where they have over 60% of the allocation in the global indices, where China still have a long way to catch up uh, you know, uh, as a single country, as allocation. So we continue to believe, one, the country has grown its economy sound and solid during those 30 years of period of time. China has accumulated a huge amount of wealth uh, for the household, also for the uh, government uh, to be very wealthy, to be prepared financially for the next stage of the country development, which is evolving them to become more sustainable growth, uh, growing as, as country. Uh, hence is why they are now um, also set the leader uh, stage for the green transition in the economy. Uh, if you turn to the next page, we also want to highlight and realizing that with all these developments happened in China, all these progress they have massively made of as a manufacturer hub being 2000 all the way to 2010 uh, and 2013, obviously they rebalanced quite successfully from industry-led to, uh, to uh, consum consumption-led. 
uh, of course, now they still continue to build that lead or continue to rebalance this economy. But it will take time for that, um, you know, rebalancing to be solid, uh, to be the key driver on long term. This page, we really just want to show you, uh, you know, uh, by country standard, by countries in, in individual countries, how their carbon emissions uh, has been, uh, you know, over the years. Clearly, China is the largest emitter, uh, you know, if you look at all its peers for very understandable uh, reasons. They have the most population, number one. They have vast developed the country. Uh, they were the manufacturing hub. All this development does come with economic cost. Uh, that being said, um, if you turn to the next page, China, uh, particularly the Chinese leaders, has realizing uh, that they uh, have a challenge to face, but, uh, they are committed to deal with this situation. If you remember, President Xi Jinping made the announcements a few years back to say China will aim to deal with the carbon uh, issues in China, uh, deal with these emission issues in China, to aim to peak at 2030, aim to become neutral as a country by 2060. They're very serious with their target. They're very serious with dealing with these challenges and toggle with, with a solution, uh, most importantly. They're very committed to deal with all sorts of issues. When they look at their CO2 emission charts, quickly they realize 80% of the CO2 emission come from energy. This is when and where, when they identified uh, their needs to deal with carbon issue uh, so that they can have a long-term sustainable growth as staging one. Staging two is China starts to say, look, let's see where is the problem, how we can deal with the problem. That deal with the problem is at the staging two at today, which means they're going to manage down the emission as much as they can. There's multiple things you can do with managing down is use less or use an alternative solution that is more environmental friend friendly or encourage people to purchase, to use, to leverage more environmental friendly, uh, you know, uh, uh, choices and options of uh, to serve their daily life. For instance, their renewable energies uh, is number one in the world. The capacity they produce in China is number one in the world. When they deal, say, can you use an alternative resource, alternative source to serve or um, to help you on daily life? What they meant by, if you need to buy a car, which is a petrol car, could you consider buy an electrical car, uh, which is uh, more subsidized, less expensive, that is social friendly, will provide some uh, certain incentive for you to consider to buy that. We have a huge, or we have witnessed a huge progress in such all these areas that we listed on this page. And all of this area, we have identified certain companies, certain sectors that are leaders in developing in these sectors, and then wrap them into the funds of K-Green. So the renewable energy China clearly produced the largest of the renewable energy uh, in the world today. And at the same time, the electrical vehicle also uh, set to be front and center of the developing uh, to achieve their top leadership uh, in such area. If we go to the next page, I just want to briefly mention today that um, the global passenger vehicles are sold worldwide. Obviously, uh, we still expect that trends continue to happen, particularly in the emerging countries that still household don't own a car, don't own a vehicle. They still aim to purchase one. But if I may take a step back to say, who are the leaders today? If we look at the electrical vehicle, a few years back, probably dominated by a few big players. Today, you will see a vast majority of available car maker from China that offers the most uh, impressive, amazing electrical vehicle, or they call them smart car. I had the pleasure to visit Neil, uh, uh, Neil House, a new warehouse in uh, Netherlands, Rotterdam, uh, really last month, that I see it, I witnessed myself, how they have been designing their car, what kind of services, what kind of car, what kind of quality they offer in their car. I was truly amazed, not because they are new. I've been looking at electrical vehicle cars myself for, for a very long time as we were looking to uh, you know, replace our old car uh, with that. Um, I have to say, uh, with everyone has a different taste. My taste doesn't represent everyone else's taste, but I do uh, want to buy an electrical vehicle car, but not totally give up uh, the interior part or the luxury part or the experience part. 
So when I tried the Neo car, I literally super impressed by the interior design as one. They're gonna have a little, uh, like a little robot you can talk to, it's called Nomi. So you can literally talk to Nomi and ask Nomi, how is the weather, take me to here, take me to there, like a bit of a robot you can literally interact with. And this is the part I like the most, that and I don't know if uh, how, how you feel about it. When I sit there and the guy was showing me the car and everything else, he says, you know what? We have a little massage function on our seat. I literally told Nomi, the little robot, very tiny bit, saying, can you switch on my, um, you know, massage on my back seats? And Nomi really did. So it was very impressive um, of all the functions, all the luxuries experience that um, Neoka has presented to me as a user. Uh, I truly amazed with the function, uh, with the availability, uh, and a certain part of them that are uh, also allowing a very new experience. If you're owning an electrical vehicle car, the first thing you worry about is battery. Uh, battery life. Uh, Neo today is offering um, swapping the battery for free. If you go to their battery house, they offer you a switch, uh, switch the battery uh, for free. So enough of my experience on Neo. I just want to give you an example of things that we have not think of, we have not heard of, that Chinese EVs are today the leaders in offering uh, high quality, uh, most impressive design in their EV cars. Um, they sold the most, they produced the most, they bought the most. If you look at the next page, we project the trends to continue to happen uh, this way. Obviously, China has the economic growth, as you can imagine, uh, which China is now urbanizing rates around 62 to 63 percent. Let's run it up. Uh, that is roughly about 800, 870 million people living in cities. Uh, we have heard it very clear that uh, from Chinese policymaker, one is uh, modernizing the society. That would have mean people would move to city and live in city more. Uh, they look up to ours as a developing country, as a benchmark. Uh, if they follow that trend, we have another 300, 400 million people to continue to move to city in the next decade. As a result, um, they would have better access um, to education, to job opportunities and become more wealthier. Um, in those instances, you would uh, see an increasing uh, amount of demand for high quality life support, like such as an uh, electrical vehicle, uh, more environmental friendly product, so on and so forth. Um, as that continue, uh, we expect the EV sales in China will increase. As such continue, we expect the investments uh, into uh, infrastructure to facilitate such to make electrical vehicles um, more readily available uh, anywhere throughout the country uh, will become more uh, feasible for the uh, electrical vehicle cars companies can use sell the cars anywhere, everywhere in China. So that being said, um, you know, um, we obviously uh, realizing that, you know, uh, a lot of things need to be in place. So for instance, if you look at the next page, what we really have here is now we say, uh, after looking at all these trends, all these years of the demands and also these years of policy setting and also the corporate developments and focus has been, is clearly showing that China is very determined to rebalance its economy to one, long-term sustainable or to rebalance its economies to be less dependent on manufacturing. Very clearly, we know they have all sorts or they have uh, upgraded a lot of their manufacturing capability to high end, those high end involved in EV, those high end involved in producing a solar panel, those high end involved in how we can upgrade our uh, power grids, for instance, how we can outsource those capabilities to outside the world. If this continue to be the trend, continue to be the goal of the Chinese policymakers set, for the country to deliver and achieve, you would expect um, a, a accommodative policy to continue to be introduced to support this market that would continue to offer China to successfully rebalance its economy to a green economy uh, and such the funding will continue to become available. Next page, I just want to touch briefly on a bit of the framework of where in China has been developing its green uh, or per se environmental uh, 
you know, re, uh, framework in place. Obviously, when China realizing this, it was um, right around the time when they become the second largest economy in the world, 2008, 2010 period of time, they start to heavily focus on getting the uh, regulation uh, framework in place, uh, getting the key body in place to make sure they have a governing uh, body in place, they have a proper channel to fund these kind of developments, uh, R&D, um, to provide them a corporate guidance, corporate tax um, advantage for the corporates to deliver. Uh, and from 2010, all the way then you see, um, you know, China has focused on uh, committed to global uh, initiatives such as when, uh, you know, President Xi Jinping signed the Paris Alignment. Also later on in 2020, he announced the 2030-2060 goal. Uh, and at 2022, right in the middle of pandemic, China hosted the first ever in history of a carbon neutral uh, Olympic um, in Beijing, which all successfully uh, do two things. One, uh, showed the rest of the world they can really deliver a large scale of projects. Second, boost all these corporates' confidence to say, as a large country, as we committed to deliver this carbon initiative, we can, and we have been showing great achievement and results that should really boost up their confidence to continue to lead all these developments in place. Obviously, our K-Green strategy in the next page is aimed to achieve, probably to capture key areas that touch all these carbon uh, initiatives. If you think of the entire transitioning of the green economy, we aim to achieve or capture all these key components along the entire ecosystems. So you have a broader access to this transition happening. But at the end of the day, what we also try to emphasize and highlight is what are the key area will help China to achieve this carbon uh, initiative um, in the country? What is the biggest emitter source, which is energy? That's why you see our fund has a bit of a heavy tilt to energy efficiency, 64% of that. But that include the car maker of NEO, that include, you know, uh, Yadask C Group uh, Holdings. That's a long uh, ecosystem grouped together to say all of them are aimed to achieve this efficiency as a whole uh, that is in there. If you break down them by subsector, you're actually going to see a lot of interesting subsectors within that label. Obviously, the alternative energy is the key focus for China to stay. What are the uh, you know, uh, supporting uh, policies? What are the supporting progress we could help to achieve in the renewable energy? Also, some alternative ways, alternative fuels for the company uh, to use to produce energy. China needs to support the 1.4 billion people with their energy needs and so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, we also highlighted some of the other area, which as a result of this green transition happening, some of the companies are focused on developing their uh, you know, waste, minimizing the recycle. Uh, to be fair, over the 30, 40 years, China has mastered uh, their uh, energy, their technology, their ways of produce or uh, recycle a lot of the waste from the rest of the world. Now they're charging uh, for such technology they have developed domestically to the rest of the world players. So all of this uh, is in our fund, including sustainable water, which is also their front and center development. In the following session, uh, my colleague Derek will go through some of the subsectors, some of the interesting corporates names to give you some of the taste from a bottom-up perspective. Derek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Xiaoling. Greetings from China. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek. I'm actually uh, in Shenzhen right now. Uh, for those who you don't know, Shenzhen is like kind of like a, a tech bay area. It's like a Silicon Valley for China. And it's also the headquarter uh, for the famous uh, China's EVs company, BYD. Uh, so in the next page, uh, you can see that uh, Xiaoling introduced like a lot of the, the themes uh, the KGRN, K-Green is investing. So what are those companies? So within the energy efficiency, right? Like Charlie mentioned, uh, there's a lot of electric vehicles. Uh, so we actually invest like Neo. Uh, Charlie mentioned a lot about Charlie's uh, Neo experience, uh, but also we have uh, investing all the major EV companies uh, like BYD. BYD is the kind of like most popular brand uh, in China and other uh, global uh, regions as well. And also Li Auto is another household name in China. It's that's very family friendly. Uh, and the Xpen, Xpen is very like tech heavy. 
a very innovative uh, EV company in China. And also in, within the ecosystem of energy efficiency, uh, we also own the battery company, for example, CATL, the world largest battery company. Uh, so you, we capture a lot of those uh, EV and battery ecosystem. And in the alternative energy space, uh, we definitely have a lot of like wind, solar, like hydro, uh, those like renewable energy solutions. Uh, and also like uh, as China's like trying to solve those uh, pollution and environmental problem, uh, we have the pollution prevention, like, like waste usage and uh, using those waste to regenerate energy and water treatment uh, companies in the portfolio. Uh, but just like the, this is uh, kind of like the solution. I think uh, one slice I like uh, from the Shaolin's presentation is really there's $200 trillion needed to make the world energy transition. And China is kind of like providing the solution to the, not only China, but globally, right? So uh, uh, we need a lot of uh, like solar panels. We need, need a lot of like electric vehicles uh, and batteries. Uh, China's not making them for the Chinese market, but increasingly we see uh, those companies going overseas and providing solution to the world. Uh, in the next page, uh, you can see that just China alone, there's a huge demand on the renewable energy uh, because the commitment by President Xi of the carbon neutral and uh, the carb like being carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutral by 2060, the energy mix has a long way to go. We're just starting. So currently, uh, coal, the, the dirty energy, still is the majority of the China's energy mix. Uh, however, that trend has to change to make carbon neutral happen, right? Like you have to shift from coal to like hydropower, to wind, to solar. Uh, that's why like China has spent like decades uh, investment into those industries to make that happen. So in the next page, I can give you an example. So solar, a lot of people think about solar, uh, people think, oh, China may be just good at solar, but actually China dominant in the world uh, solar industry. Uh, just if you don't know the process, how to make a solar panel, uh, so you have to make first materials like polysilicon, uh, process that to the wafer and to sell them, put it together into module, then you put out a panel, then you ship those panel to the solar farm, either in China or in Europe or in the United States, right? So there's a lot of demand, especially from Europe side, a lot of demand on solar, like building solar farms uh, to really rebalance the energy mix. Uh, so the huge demand is from uh, the, the solar panels. Well, China captured uh, about 80% of polysilicon, 97% uh, uh, of waiver, 85% of cell, and 75% of module. So the whole manufacturing value chain uh, is kind of like dominated by China right now. Uh, uh, why is that? I, I'm going to tell you later about the reason behind it. But the next page, you can see that for the batteries, same game. Uh, all the leading players uh, in the world battery market uh, is kind of like led by Chinese companies. Uh, CATL, I, I just I, as mentioned, is the largest battery provider in the world. It's about like 30, one third of the global market share. BYD comes to Nest, but uh, after those top two, you also have a lot of actually smaller Chinese uh, battery makers. Uh, for example, CALB, Guoxuan, uh, the names like you, you have a lot of players. Uh, so China's easily make more than 50% of market share. Uh, in the Nest page, you can see that electric vehicle is not a thing. So China is the largest market for electric vehicle, uh, but this penetration rate is increasing, right? Like we are seeing just, I, I like Shaolin's slides, like within all those fleet on the road, electric vehicle is still tiny, right? There's a lot of countries out there. There's a lot of traditional cars out there that people are ready to switch, ready to uh, kind of like adopt this new type of vehicle. Um, so. In the next page, you can see that uh, China is really leading this adoption, right? So 
Uh, I'm I'm in Shenzhen right now. Uh, I was actually traveling to China for almost two weeks now. Uh, I'm in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen. You you will see a lot of uh, actually the street is very quiet because you see a lot of electric vehicle on the road. Uh, I I probably ride about like twenty electric vehicles. Uh, using like Didi, Didi is kind of like the the taxi service in China, and also like taxis is all electric vehicles. You 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 see a lot of brands. You see like BYD's showrooms, very fancy, very nice cars, uh, high quality. Uh, but when you ask, uh, I think the most important thing, like you have to ask those like taxi drivers or like uh, the car drivers, why they're using electric vehicles instead of like the combust like internal combustion engine traditional cars, right? Um, surprise to me, just like surprise to me. Uh, I originally thought like, oh, it, it was because of subsidies, because it's like we're going to pay a lot of money for them to buy those electric vehicles. But actually, the subsidies is gone. It's for the new purchase, they don't have a subsidies. So in previous, in the early times, they get some money from the government for tax refund uh, for buying electric vehicles. But actually, no, there's no elect, uh, subsidies, subsidy, uh, subsidies now. Uh, so the reason they told me is actually they're getting a better car with the same price or or the same quality compared to traditional car. They're paying a less. Uh, I, I see there is like amazing experience. You, the car cost about twenty thousand dollars, but you get a luxury experience. The interior design, the smartness, the how the technology interpretation because the electric vehicle, uh, and uh, like so many new functions can be built within the car, give you a whole nother level experience with very affordable price. So that's why those so many Chinese brands are taking market share. For example, BYD is kind of like the most popular uh, EV and hybrid car in the world today, uh, passing Tesla last year. So that's showing the power of high quality and low price, right? That is so simple. Uh, actually, I was just reading an interview for the CEO of BYD. Uh, they're learning the Toyota model. So actually, the CEO of to Toyota visited BYD. Like, how can you make the car so affordable but with maintain a high quality? I think that's kind of like the 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 this generation of China's CEOs entrepreneurs is kind of like very different. They were smart. They were good at organization. Um, BYD has like many facilities in China. You have to manage all the like 30 cities, facilities, super factories. And also you have managed thousands of components, like then like the supply chains uh, is very hard to manage. Like the uh, upstream supplies, uh, suppliers, how you can ma manage like efficiently so you can manage the cost down and you can die up, die down the capacity. So BYD just made it happen. Uh, same for like Neo. Uh, so each one take like it, each, uh, so just like the traditional cars, uh, each like electric vehicle companies now taking their own market shares, right? Neo is taking more like high-end, more premium ones. Li Auto is more family friendly. Uh, it's targeting those like families who want more space, uh, they want to travel outside to the suburbs, going hiking uh, and expands for younger generation who like the leading technologies and BYD just like high quality and low price. So everyone has its own market and Tesla is kind of like losing market share for the, uh, from the local players. And uh, also, also we talk a lot of like Thailand, also other like Southeast Asia, like Middle East, uh, now those brands are going overseas. Uh, they're actually uh, in Thailand, BYD is very popular, right? So just like, I think Malaysia is another uh, uh, big, big market. So once you establish this uh, leadership, uh, you, you, you just have a lower price, better car. You can sell overseas. You can take market share globally, right? That's so easy. So in the next page, um, I'm gonna, dive a li little bit into why China is making this leadership in uh, not only in the electric vehicles, batteries, solars, just like cross the clean energy. Why is that? Uh, take solar example. Uh, the cost is cheaper in China. 
Uh, so for solar, uh, the material cost, right? Like refinery cost, uh, the, uh, the, the, the upstream suppliers, like for those material refineries uh, is, is much cheaper. Uh, and also labor cost is much cheaper. Uh, we're not talking about like traditional like cheap labors, but we're talking about uh, very skilled labors. You need a lot of those engineers. You need a, like a lot of them. Uh, you need like hundreds of thousands of the engineers to operate in those smart factories. And China's able to do that because China has the well-educated next generation of talents. A lot of people have like, college degrees and uh, they graduated with like very sophisticated education, being able to handle the next generation of smart manufacturing. So those uh, talent pool of skilled engineers and labels are making the, the cost of manufacturing the next generation of technology like clean tech much cheaper in China compared, uh, I, I don't need to say the developed country, but also other emerging markets because the, the educated labor in China is is much abundant, uh, so that making export affordable, like uh, reasonable, right? Like when you can make things cheaper in China, then you export it, you can make money, right? So that's the cost leader. Then the next page, uh, most importantly, uh, is the tech leader. I think China is like transitioning from the manufacturing center to kind of like innovation center. Uh, one example is the. Uh, you probably heard from news like Volkswagen and Exxon done a deal that like the German auto giants now have to uh, re some kind of like want to leverage the China startup uh, technology on electric vehicle in terms of, like designing, in terms of a lot of like uh, how do you build a better electric, electric vehicles. So that is kind of like now changing because in China it's highly competitive, right? You have to competing with all those competitors in China. So you have to keep invest in technology. You, be, you build a better car, more like uh, acceleration is more powerful, or the riding experience is better, or like you have all those core technologies in terms of the turning around or like uh, all those core uh, like innovations, That's, that is happening because the comp competition in China. So with like years of competition, those startups or those like Chinese EV brands has accumulated technology that can lead uh, their peers globally. Same thing happened in the batteries, like CATL have this like new battery that's like much longer range than the Tesla's battery and can drive up to a hundred, a thousand kilometer range. So the range anxiety is kind of like solved for a lot of high-end cars. And they have like fast charging capability to to charge the battery within 10 minutes. So that's technology lead leadership in the battery side. Same for the solar side, like Longji, uh, a famous China solar company, uh, is actually breaking through the boundary for the energy efficiency uh, for the solar cells. So those are like examples, like probably you'd never heard, but here in, in Shenzhen, kind of like tech center in China, there's innovation everywhere. There's so many startups. Everyone has a dream to build a business here. Young people is like very energetic. They're in their like 30s, 40s, but they're building their dream here. Uh, they're kind of like connecting with uh, the, the rest of the world. There's so many foreigners here. Actually today there's an AI conference downstairs. Uh, you see so many like foreign visitors uh, just jointly have brainstorming like uh, those entrepreneurs, those uh, kind of like tech innovation here is kind of like phenomenon. So I think the tech leadership is something people didn't notice that's really China is kind of like going that way. You invest a lot of money into the R&D that can build a competitive edge globally. Uh, so in the next page, uh, you can see that uh, for K-Green, we use uh, MCI index to capture the basket of China's clean technology, right? Like you could probably have like one idea or you probably invest in one company that's good, but this is still early stage. We think this is a secular long-term trend. Uh, this, this energy transition is early. This electric vehicle adoption, this uh, batteries, those solars, just so early. We have a lot of things, so many years, we need to invest, we need to develop 
uh, you know, taking market share globally. So uh, index, a basket approach, uh, partner with MCI, we think it's a better approach uh, uh, with MCI uh, uh, capability of ESG and climate. Uh, so in the next page, so you can see that MCI is very focused on the process. Their ESG research uh, is kind of like leading uh, in, the, in the industry. So we rely on the MCI's ESG research on a lot of those clean technology uh, identification. So with that, well, we partner with MCI, we are able to provide global investor a solution, not only solve China's problem, but the global problem for the energy transition and a uh, carbon neutral world. So in the next page, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Xiaoling uh, to give a more like introduction of the uh, Crane Shares MCI China Clean Technology Index uses ETF. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Derek. And um, you know, I, I hope for the audience who join us today, obviously we have a CPD available if you need one to get in touch with us. But I feel like I hope the audience join us appreciate it. Um, this is one thing we're very proud at Crane Shares is we see it ourselves. We experience it ourselves. Um, we're telling you without a bias of what is happening in China. What are the trends evolving in China? What are the long-term investment trends? It really deserve a core cool allocation in your client's portfolio, thinking of the whole world is evolving, China is progressing, China is transitioning, and these kind of trends, trends happening, like you were saying, this summit happening in your hotel right now, this second. A lot of entrepreneurs there basically brainstorming their ideas and then capitalizing, uh, contributing. Uh, to all this progress, we just mentioned all these Chinese companies in our K Green Fund. There may be many more to come. Uh, it's our job, obviously, to go and see it ourselves and go and hear it ourselves and present them in a solution for you uh, to know how and where or maybe consider to allocate to them. And K Green is a classic example. Uh, many of our solutions at Crangers are literally come from that way. It's what we see, how we see things evolving and happening, and why and where we can capitalize and capture those kind of opportunities. So I hope the audience appreciate that. And thank you so much, Derek, for staying up so late uh, in China and joining our webinar today. The last page is really um, uh, some of the uh, statistics information on K-Green funds. You have the icing here, you have the exchanges um, that we listed here, you have the top 10 holdings, many of the names that Derek actually touched based on uh, them a bit briefly just now in the in the earlier session, some of the names um, that you, you know, what we get explained. Like I said, if you have any questions, please send them through um, that um, we can uh, address them, answer them, uh, keep the question coming, we'll address them all we can. So at this juncture, uh, if I go through some of the uh, um, housekeeping, the disclaimer, if you can flip through those pages. If you have questions, please send them through at info at cranesures.com or send with this link um, that we address them as much as we can. Um, right, Derek, uh, let's look at some questions from the audience. Okay, and thank you for sending them through. Keep them coming. Uh, we have some time today to, to address your questions. So here we got a question um, on China's talent pool. Uh, what about the fact that China has a talent mismatch? Uh, I think here was referring that earlier days we have, you know, uh, some graduates actually want to work in tech and AI, but China still needs skills in property and semiconductor. Do you want to go or I shall have a go? What do you think the mismatch of talent in China? Yeah, I, I also like I, I want to comment like I I talk a lot of people here. Uh, over mm -hmm. the last three years, there's uh definitely like the COVID lockdown. Uh, so during the COVID, a lot of like students they choose to postpone graduation, or they choose like higher education. Uh, so like for that, like then all of a sudden when when it's reopening, there's a lot of people replying for jobs. Uh, so uh for the I think the talent mismatch. A lot of, uh, I think, question is like the graduates want to work in the tech and AI, uh, but uh, they need skills, right? They need experience. Uh, but China, I think, good thing about China is like the entrepreneurs is is very uh, innovative. So they they can hire a lot of the talents, but apparently there's a massive amount of graduates. So still, there's some like talents cannot 
fill those positions because uh, mm -hmm. there's like too many graduates uh, over the last three years, right? But this mm -hmm. is like a very thing because mm -hmm. yeah. a long time, there's more like uh, openings happening and then those graduates gonna find a job and then they're gonna uh, transition their like focus uh, to the most innovative and then uh, on the technology side, especially the clean technology side. Yeah, I'd agree, Derek. I think, uh, um, you know, the, um, there is a, a structural and a cyclical side. We don't uh, disagree, structural side. There may be some mismatch because from 2000 all the way 20, 20, uh, 2010, 2020, we do need a lot of these um, uh, certain sectors, probably property, you know, like uh, the lower end of the valuation. And there's another question coming in on the uh, young, yours uh, unemployment rates, 20%. I'll answer those together. So <clears throat> structurally, China is rebalance, if rebalancing its economy. I remember early in 2000 that we definitely need computer scientists, right? Uh, 1990s and 2000. That is when and where, when I go to study in the university and I have a tiger mom and she's like, I was like, I want to learn mass communication. And she's like, what is that? <laughs> okay. Um, no, you're learning computer science. So I, I learned computer science in 1990s when such subject just get introduced to China. Remember, suddenly all the university has set up the courses for some, you know, computer scientists or computer technology, computer energy, uh, uh, engineering to be available. I think, you know, in any country, education needs to stay front and center um, to make sure they have uh, the way or capabilities to um, feed up to the economy with real talents that help the economy um, grow and rebalance and transition and progress further. Um, structurally, uh, there may be some of the uh, area they educated in now is the area that they probably want to work elsewhere. I don't necessarily think education, uh, your, where you graduate as a major for your academic, restricted you from entering another sector or another industry to work. I'm a classic example. I learned computer scientist, economics, investing was never my major. Okay, I crossed from computer science. Uh, I studied all my education in computer science and I come working in finance. Um, I somehow think uh, this is getting addressed. So there's a lot of schools in China today is training you with such skills. Uh, you can certainly attend them uh, while you're studying at the university or chose that path to be become a, a very specialized in certain skill sets you needed. So they are addressing the structural side. Cyclical side, um, obviously you're going to see some seasonality, some cyclical rebalancing, some of the fresh graduating. I think these questions on the your uh, unemployment rate, a couple of things happening is um, in China, uh, Derek, you probably uh, can add more color because you do your education, you did your bachelor in China. You would agree with me if you uh, finish your university or even didn't go to your university that's your uh, age of 16 17 18 all the way to 24 that's right around high school before university and also just after university that period of time most of the people chose to further uh, education advanced education master phd um, education if you chose start working those jobs you would get would be a bit of a lower in the value chain um, i.e., you know, some of the uh, real estate developing project, you probably easily to get into those later. And China is addressing such issues to deal with those part of the curve of the employment is by one, introducing this one trillion bond issued by the government to lend it to local government, either to do infrastructure or to be, um, you know, helping on natural disaster preventions, all these projects. Once those kick in, you see flows, you see job creation, need of workers low skilled, those are the group of the people they target, you know. And um was it yesterday or two days before that also the Bloomberg sourced to say that PBOC is aimed to provide another one trillion uh I mean B. Uh, to help on urban or modernizing villages of the property side. So those can easily create a job. I'm I, all I'm saying is if policy is in place, projects start to kick off, those young people will be very easy to find a job to deal with the situation uh, in that way. Would you agree, Derek? I totally agree. Yeah. So um my example is like I mean uh I mean in China only 50% of people can go to high school then within high school there's uh, not a chance to go to like uh, college, right? Like, so like a lot of my friends who finished college graduation, 
they have very competitive in job market actually. So mm -hmm. I think now more and more people like they finish the college education and also pursue a higher PhD degree. So that is providing a massive talent pool to those innovative industry in China. Um, so in the long run, it's actually lowering the cost of innovation. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. even though like in the short term, there's uh, some like volatility in, in the employment rate, but uh, on, on the long run, that is reshaping China's economy. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so we have a few more questions. Um, uh, Derek, we probably have a few time to address your three here. Um, but one of them was more of, uh, on, uh, you know, some of the catalysts we may potentially see uh, in near term, um, uh, you know, on China uh, clean tech. Any are there any near term positive catalysts that you see for China's uh, clean tech? I say um, the catalyst for China for China's clean tech has always been there. For a very simple reason, I think I mentioned this very briefly. Uh, if you see uh, all the policy announced, even from last October, when President Xi Jinping got reelected as the Chinese Communist leader uh, in October, in his work report, he mentioned this carbon uh, initiative goal front and center as one of the two goals that he's aimed to achieve. This sector has always been uh, provided sufficient, very accommodative corporate policies um, for the corporate to continue to develop. Uh, that as one second is always funding available. I mentioned the funding, I don't know if they give the number. China has spent um, $500 billion every single year, okay, in supporting uh, clean tech development, developments, clean tech developments, uh, R&D, uh, help the corporate to be uh, focusing on innovation, uh, internationalization, expanding their capabilities, and so on and so forth. Where in Europe, I'm in Europe, so I live in London, uh, in Europe, we aim to spend the same amount of money, slightly more, 586 over six years of period. That is a comparison. That is why the corporates there have those kind of accommodative policy, has this funding available, has every possible catalyst for the corporate to focus on your own development and progress and deliver for the country to achieve the carbon goal period at the end. So that's what I see. I don't know if any potential expectations for near term of the events and catalysts happen, but I just pause there and say this would be the area, the sector have a long term policy supports funding supports the initiative that match national strategy, national goals, national plan for China to deliver, achieve, and above and beyond. Derek, do you have anything to add there? A near-term catalyst? Yeah. Right. Um, I have a challenge to hear you. Maybe your, your, I don't know if your internet may be free. So, I'll just pause there. If Derek comes back online, I'd like him to address that question. But that's what I would say and what I would see um, that, you know, how uh, the support from the uh, policymaker in China continue to support this sector, continue to support this industry. In some of the ways that, um, you know, one of you asked how uh, China's shape to be more of a service economy benefit China's clean tech. Um, at the end of the day, those two are the big initiative. I repeat that is one is the big goal that if you read Xi Jinping's work report and also the policy centered around is let's make sure China become a modernized society. Modernization comes up a lot. Uh, and secondly, that um, China has been mentioning, we need to achieve this decarbonization goal. So those are the two big goals for China to focus, focus in the next five years, if not next decade to achieve that. The modernization, the urbanization is to get more people to uh, city, live in city, so on and so forth, and access that. And also China realizing from 1980s, when they reopened the uh, economy uh, to the rest of the world, all the way to 2010, those 30 years, if you remember, they did nothing but build up the country infrastructure, make sure everything is ready. That made them, as a country, even today, a lot of people ask us, oh, they, the exports is no longer the, you know, the, the manufacturing hub. No problem. They have upgraded themselves to the higher value of the uh, manufacturer chip, number one. Number two, they have still, period end, best logistics in the region uh, as a single country. So they have delivered that. Then they realize 
that kind of economic model will not get them to continue to grow. A sustainable, a service-driven kind of economy would be more uh, relied, more needed uh, for them to have long-term sustainable achieved GDP. Uh, they obviously hope for the next decade when they achieve these two goals, okay, modernization, and decarbonization would require them to grow the economy at 5% year over year for the next decade. And that is the goal uh, for the country to achieve. And then every day, the service of the economy would mean, for instance, Alibaba continue to hire more people, uh, continue to offer product as a workplace or marketplace to continue to have more merchants, more than the uh, hundreds of millions of people they have there, to have more merchants there to make sure they offer the service to the to the society to give them the platform to buy also uh, as an employer to continue to grow and continue to expand we have baba's earnings come out today and a huge eye on that see how they have done in the in q2 but the end of the day those is linked to the requirement for the com company itself to also become a sustainable growing its economy as a whole anyhow so if you look at baba and jd and pinodua their building in beijing their headquarters in shenzhen i hope have Derek back online is all the new building they build that is environment environment friendly they use a lot of data per process the data process customers data they need a very efficiency building uh you know they need the energy efficiency of their building a lot of the headquarters I hope uh, you have the chance to join us. We did that pre-pandemic to have our international investors join us in China to see uh, all these developments yourself. So if you're interested, get in touch with your uh, contact at Crane Share. We're very happy to, to have you on our trip next time. Um, is they have all these very environmental friendly, social aware. They have the most advanced technology to use the energy in their building as much as they can. So all of them actually link together. Derek, I have you back. Hi, can Perfect. you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you for, Great. for coming back. Um, yeah, I, just I wanna, was just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add uh, for the near term, right? Like we all know like mm -hmm. strategically, this is a very like cyclical, uh, 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 secular growth industry in China, right? With very mm -hmm. competitive, uh, very competitive industry uh, with their capability compared to global peers. But uh, just end of the day is still emerging market growth, right? Like just what happened in over the last few years, we have the Fed hiking interest rate. So money moving out of the emerging market, especially moving mm -hmm. out of the growth market. So the valuation is coming down. And now we're seeing this kind of like going to uh, end of the cycle. So when you turn, when the macro environment change, you will still have money flow into the emerging market it flow into the growth sector. So we, we think that could be a big catalyst uh, for the clean technology mm -hmm. center. Uh, another thing mm -hmm. that I wanna mention is the overseas market is huge. So China mm -hmm. is the largest market in the world today, but the, the rest of the world, especially other emerging market, uh, other developed market, the penetration rate is still low, right? So when you have such a good car, uh, you uh, naturally, those companies are now expanding globally. They're operating globally, <laughs> selling the cars globally. So that can drive the second stage of the growth of a lot of those brands. Uh, and also for like uh, renewable energies, uh, the overseas market is kind of like a most important market for a lot of brands. So the globalization and global expansion uh, will be uh, not a catalyst. For the, for, the, for the fundamental growth for those companies. Mm. So both mm. fundamental and valuation, I think currently we're still in a very low valuation because the mm -hmm. Fed cycle and because the global emerging market and growth sector cycle, uh, but that cycle could change. Uh, that could be a big uh, a turning point for the sector. Wonderful, wonderful, Derek. Um, that's all the time we have uh, for today. I hope you find the session useful. Uh, if you uh, need um, any more explanations, support on the strategy, Derek and I would be very happy uh, to organize a separate call with you. If you have any questions that is unanswered, um, we didn't get a chance or time to answer your question, please do get in touch at info at gracious.com. Derek and I would be very happy to provide you those kind of uh, answers to uh, fit your uh, investment assessments. With that, thank you, Derek, for joining us from Shenzhen in China. Have a lovely night and thank you for all of you who joined us today.